Ah, uh, yeah. Welcome in. Welcome back to another episode of Format Podcast, Saturday Night Live. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And tonight is yours truly, me, Mr. B, Bruce Hope, and I am going to be holding it down solo. Um, my guys had some stuff to do, so um, I don't normally do the Saturday Night Lives uh, by myself, as you know. But I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to I'm going to do that tonight and uh, should be fun, should be fun. So what I'm going to do first is uh, I'm going to chill for a few minutes here. Uh, wait till we get some people in the chat. Then we are going to go ahead and we're going to set it off. And we got some uh, pretty interesting topics for you. So um, let's take a few minutes and uh, let's hang out. And um, yeah, while I while I watch the end of this Florida LSU game and watch the Gators put the finishing touches on the LSU Tigers and uh for those of you who know me, you know I'm not an SEC guy, but I will say, go Gators, right? Definitely. And uh, I'll, I'll break that down to you in a few minutes why I feel that way about it. But, um, yeah, we'll just chill for a few minutes, and then, then we'll get it popping. Yeah, Brian Kelly does not look happy, and I can always enjoy that. There we go. All right. All right. All right. Ooh, Gators got seven sacks tonight. That is, that's vicious. I like that though. I like that. Go Gators for tonight. <laughs> um, let's see. Yeah, we'll just wait a couple more minutes. Uh, see, see if we can get a couple more people in the chat. Then I'll. Go ahead and uh, do my thing, and uh, we will have some fun talking some sports tonight. So let's uh, let's let's see what's going on. We'll just wait another minute or two, and then we'll get started. <clears throat> In case you're wondering what I'm doing while I'm waiting, I'm just uh, sitting here watching the end of this uh, Florida LSU game. Um, very happy about that. Obviously, Notre Dame is over. They won, so I'm great there. But uh, this is a little bit of icing on the cake, and then uh, – I'll have uh, Georgia and Tennessee on for, while I'm uh, while I'm uh, broadcasting with y'all. So definitely um, should be a good night. Should be a good night. Salam, Sneed was good, my brother. Good to see you, brother. How are you, man? Good to see you. Transformer, you know better, man. You better go to YouTube and hit that like button. <laughs> you know better, bro. <laughs> Come on now. Uh, let's see. All right. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, before we get started, you know what time it is. I'm going to hit my little thing and then we'll, we'll get it. If you're here on YouTube and you haven't already, please make sure you go ahead, click that like, that subscribe, that notification bell. Make sure you're kept up to date whenever we drop new content on the channel. If you want the audio only version of the podcast, open up your audio podcast platform, hit the search bar, type in the format podcast, and we should come right up if you're enjoying the content make sure you give us that like that five star review and drop a comment all that stuff helps us rise in the algorithm helps us find more sports fans helps more sports fans find us and finally make sure you write it down put it in your phone set an alarm do whatever you got to do to remember saturday nights at 7 p.m we are live here on the format podcast and we'll give you the opportunity to call in talk to us get at me i love it i can't i can't wait i can't wait all right so um uh, shouts to everybody who's here, man. I appreciate y'all. Um, yeah, let's get it going. So, uh, we got some good, uh, topics tonight. I think, uh, definitely should enjoy it. Um, first, obviously, uh, as you can see by the rundown, we're going to talk, uh, Tyson and the Netflix dud. That was a interesting situation. And, 
uh, a not so interesting fight. Um, then we'll go go to the NBA. We'll talk about the undefeated Cleveland Cavaliers and uh, are they not getting as much love as they deserve? Uh, we will talk about LeBron James, my <laughs> arguably least favorite player ever. But we got to give him his flowers where they're due and talk about the fact that he is still at it at a tremendous pace for somebody who's been around so long. Uh, and then finally, we'll uh, finish it up with the uh, the NFL and uh, talk a little bit about who is the best team in the NFC. Um, <laughs> Bruce, Bruce, what's good, bro? I'm going to get to that, man. I'm definitely going to get to that. Um, I, it's not going to be a whole topic, but I'm definitely going to talk about it. And it's funny, I was talking to my homeboy about it earlier, and I, I mentioned that exact thing that I can't wait to hear uh, what he has to say about it on uh, on Monday on his show. So, yeah, I'm going to get to that. Somehow, man, you, you're always a step ahead of me on these topics, man. But I appreciate the love. All right. So um, let's get started with some some quick hits first. All right. So the first quick hit, as I mentioned, while I was kind of waiting for some people to get into the get into the um, into the chat here. I'm a big college football fan. As you all know, I am a diehard Notre Dame fighting Irish fan. And Notre Dame continues to do what they've been doing uh, for the most part all season. They have been dominating the weaker teams on their schedule. And that's what the good teams do, right? The really good teams dominate the weaker teams that they play. They beat Virginia today, 35 to 14. I think they were up. Um, they were up 28 nothing at half. So kind of disappointing that they didn't uh, score more and really uh, run it up on them in the second half, and not run it up on them in in terms of being unsportsmanlike, but run it up on them in terms of you know college football, the whole eye test, and you got to impress the committee with big wins and all this nonsense. So you got to do it how you got to do it. But uh, Marcus Freeman has this team playing really well, especially after that terrible uh, week two loss to uh, Northern Illinois. And realistically, that's probably uh, the worst loss of any playoff contending team in the country. And Notre Dame is still paying for that, but. They have done exactly what they should have done ever since then. They have taken it one game at a time, one week at a time. What do we say? Go 1-0 and every week, and that's what they've been doing. And they've got two weeks left to do that. They've got Army next week, which could be a tougher matchup than they anticipate, obviously playing those uh, service academy teams with that triple option, uh, wing T, uh, veer type offense is very difficult to defend, takes a lot of eye discipline, a lot of uh, really good film study. And the fact that they're so different, uh, offensively from every team that you will play from the rest of the season makes it even more difficult to uh, deal with. But they have to go out there and they have to get it done. And then they will finish up at USC, who I'm sure a lot of people thought would be a lot better this year, but aren't. So Notre Dame has two games left. They win those both of those games, and they may have a legitimate chance to host a playoff game in the first ever 12-team playoff in the first round. So this this could get very interesting. So that's Notre Dame. That's that quick hit. I'm not going to get too much into it. Uh, second quick hit. Uh, as my main man Bruce mentioned, Colorado Buffaloes. Um, some of you have been here with me for a while. Some of you are newer. Last year on this very show, I said that Colorado coming into the Big 12 had a legitimate chance to win the conference. And here they are with a legitimate chance. I think they need two more wins and they will play for the Big 12 conference championship. And with that offense and with the way the defense is rounding into form and really playing well, under defensive, uh, I think, assistant D-line coach Warren Sapp. Um, you see them really getting after the passer. They're doing a better job stopping the run. You know, uh, no one's going to mistake them for Georgia defensively, but that is a really a much improved, I should say, defensive football team. So uh, they're doing that. We know the offense, when they get going with Shadur Sanders and Travis Hunter and the rest of those weapons can be a real laser light show. You just got to keep uh, Shadur Sanders upright. And I believe that by far he's the best quarterback in the country. I believe that by far out of all the quarterbacks coming out this year, he will have the best NFL career. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, I believe by far he's better than every quarterback that came out last year. That should tell you how high I am on Shadur Sanders. I think the guy is that freaking good. But with all of that said, I do believe, and I said it last year, as I mentioned, Colorado has a legitimate chance to win the Big 12. If they do that in their very first season in the Big 12, in Coach Prime's second season as head coach of Colorado, in just the third season since Colorado was 1-11 and overall, with an average loss, uh, with an average uh, uh, point differential of minus 29, they will have made the college football playoff. Is that not a story? Is that not a story? And, and Bruce, he mentioned uh, Jason Whitlock. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Jason Whitlock. He is a, uh, well, Bruce said it. He, he, he is not a big fan of Coach Prime. Uh, he doesn't like the way Coach Prime does things, and that's his prerogative. Uh, but also, um, he, you know, he's been consistently ripping him on his show. And 
Jason Whitlock, uh, he's an African-American longtime uh, sports writer and journalist. And now uh, he hosts a, I'll say, a very conservative uh, show on YouTube, which he has some sports talk. He mixes that in with some uh, political talk, so on and so forth. And I'm not going to get into that, but I will say um, he's not a, a lot of African-Americans aren't huge fan of his, fans of his. I won't say where I am in my stance on that, but I will say that uh, Jason Whitlock, again, he he's the guy who carries the water for the right. That said, I think there's nothing wrong with being able to listen to both sides, whether you agree or not. Right. You can always learn from people, whether it's learning not what to say, learning not what to do, um, whether or not you uh, agree with people. You can always still learn something somehow. Right. So anyway, Jason Whitlock, he's been kind of banging on Coach Prime since uh, last season. And uh, it's going to be funny because he has had to, as this season has progressed, begrudgingly admit that Coach Prime has done an outstanding job. He hasn't used the word outstanding, but I'll, I'll put that in for him. An outstanding job in building up this Colorado program and, and having a great deal of success with it. So it's kind of funny. That's why I'm saying like uh, Monday morning, I will be excited to hear his show and hear what he has to say about it. In these situations, it's funny to hear each week what somebody has to say when they're kind of forced to eat crow, right? All right, so there's that. And then finally, uh, the third part of this quick hit when it comes to college football is uh, <laughs> Brian Kelly, former head coach of Notre Dame Fighting Irish, left the team three years ago. Uh, yes, this is Marcus Freeman's third year. So he left the team three years ago and he went to quote unquote greener pastures. Right. What does he mean by that? He went and became the head coach of the LSU uh, Tigers in Baton Rouge, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in the SEC. And so. He left there and everyone was applauding. And first of all, I'm not sure why when everyone knows that he was LSU's second choice, they wanted Lincoln Riley, but they only grabbed him because Lincoln Riley shunned them and went to USC. But that's a different story. Anyway, uh, what's up, Steve? Man, you, you're on one tonight already, I see. So anyway, um, Brian Kelly goes to LSU and everyone's talking about, oh, he wanted to go where the big boys play and he wanted to go where he would have a chance to win. And, uh, you know, he wanted to go, well, really where he wanted to go was a place where he didn't have to do the work to recruit because in that part of the country, right, uh, everyone in Louisiana grows up playing football, wanting to play for LSU. So the recruiting is almost done by itself. And then, you know, you have that small area if you want to get out, maybe grab a, a couple of Florida guys, a couple of Georgia guys, some Mississippi guys, some Alabama guys, right? But for the most part, your recruiting is covered by itself. And then, of course, you know, you don't have the – strenuous academic conditions <laughs> for the student athletes at LSU versus a place like uh, Notre Dame. Obviously you have the weather advantage. So Brian Kelly, he thought he was just going to walk into it. Everything was going to be gravy and that he would be, you know, he would be all good, but uh, he hasn't been able to get it done yet. Now he did get a Heisman trophy winner in uh, Jaden Daniels last year. So shall stand for that. But um, you see, he's really struggling this year. I want to say that's the, that's what the third loss for LSU this year, I believe. Right. So it's third loss for LSU. They just got beat by a bad Florida team in the swamp. What does that say? And you're starting to hear uh, from the um, LSU media contingent. You even heard uh, last week from the Louisiana governor. He took a shot at the LSU uh, Tiger football program. And people are really not happy with Brian Kelly. And it's so funny because as Notre Dame fans, you know, we were all pretty uh, we were not upset at all when Brian uh, Kelly decided to move on uh, to, again, these quote unquote greener pastures. We weren't upset at that at all. But I'll tell you, me personally, as a Notre Dame fan, what I was upset about was that his uh, his coaching staff and that his former players had to hear that, uh, you know, online instead of hearing it from him. And then when they heard it, he gave a quick press conference the following morning. And I think he spoke to the team for less than five minutes. I, I didn't respect that at all. This is a team where all these players literally, you know, put their bodies on the line for you week in and week out. And, and you know, during during the summer when they were getting in the weight room for workouts and all that. And I'm not saying necessarily you owe them, but you owe them better than what you gave them. And that's five minutes to say, hey, I guess you heard. All right, I'm out. You know, and that's not cool. So anyway, all the LSU people, they thought we were just jealous that he was leaving and going to them. But it's funny because. Now they're seeing what it really is. And you're seeing reports if you're into college football about how uh, people in, around, in and around the LSU program don't like Brian Kelly. So every time he loses, we Notre Dame people, we just take probably an inordinate and maybe even unhealthy amount of joy in uh, watching that happen. So it was real cool to watch a bad Florida team 
beat uh, Brian Kelly and the LSU Tigers. So that was fantastic. So that's my uh, that's my quick hits on uh, college football. And um, uh, definitely wanted to uh, make sure I talked about that. Um, da, 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 da. So um, second quick hit. I'm not going to get too much into this because it's just kind of in talks. So we know that I, I know I've been one of the main people talking about the terrible state of the NBA, right? Because you get all these people, I know, and that's mo- for the most part younger people, but uh, you know, the millennials and the Gen Z or who, however you classify them. And they're always telling me, oh, Bruce, you're just an old head hater. Uh, the modern NBA, the players today are so much better. The NBA is so much better. And I keep saying it, the product is terrible. The product is terrible. The product is terrible. No one wants to listen to me, right? A big part of the reason why Le- the, the product is terrible, LeBron. Um, for instance, the all-star game and the all-star weekend, the all-star game has gotten terrible. Why? Guys don't want to compete. They're on all this friendly crap. They don't want to go out there and get busy. Back in the day, even guys who were friends were still going at each other in the all-star game, right? Again, nobody's saying that they should behave as if it's uh, game seven of the NBA finals, but you guys are making a lot of money. The fans are watching you go out there and compete. Give the fans something to see. Even beyond that, back in the day, uh, if you were an athletic player, a high flying player, what was what was kind of your unspoken responsibility as an NBA high flyer and added, uh, athletic player was to participate in the slam dunk contest. LeBron made it cool for those type of players not to participate in the slam dunk contest. Now, I know people because, oh, you're a hater, you're a hater. Why everything got to be LeBron? Because guys were doing it until LeBron decided that he wasn't going to. You can get mad at me all you want, but that is the case. All right. So so we know the glamour event of All Star Weekend, that's now pretty much, you know, turned to dust. And that's the uh, slam dunk contest. Now that's been taken over by the three point contest, because honestly, I don't even care about the slam dunk contest anymore. I want to see the three point contest and what's going to happen there. The All Star game itself in the NBA has almost gone to like turning into the Pro Bowl. In, in the NFL and the Pro Bowl, as you know, is now gone. They don't even play it anymore. So I don't I doubt that the all star game has too much longer to last. And the reason I bring this up as a quick hit, because I was reading an article and this is uh, Sports Illustrated online. And it says the headline is NBA in talks on bold new format for 2025 all star game in San Francisco. And first, the first thing I thought was, man, the NBA is in bad shape, right? And especially the All-Star Weekend. Why? Because they keep having to try and change and tweak and adjust this All-Star game to try and regain some interest, right? And remember a few weeks back, I did the show with President Obama and he flat out told Tyrese Halliburton like, yo, well, he didn't say you guys suck, but basically he's like, you guys aren't playing hard. You need to do something to fix this All-Star game because it's it's terrible and I'm not going to be watching anymore, right? And there are tons and tons of people who would echo that sentiment, who guys who are basketball fans who remember a better day and a better product in the NBA. And it's not just an in my day or, you know, old man yelling at clouds or, hey, you kids, get off my lawn. It's not just that, right? It's really, if you just look at it, you know, game for game, the product was better back then. And so anyway, what we have now, and we know this because Adam Silver was utterly disgusted by the state of the uh, NBA All-Star game for the last few of them, right? Last year before the All-Star game, I think it was in Indianapolis, uh, Larry Bird and Dr. J and those guys literally had to come into the locker rooms and try to beg these guys to compete. Now, are, are we serious? Like, who would have had to come into the locker room and beg Larry Larry Bird and Dr. J and Michael Jordan to compete? Man, those guys wanted to get out there and go get it. But, you know, that mentality doesn't exist today in these modern players. It's absolutely terrible. Um... Yeah, Sneed, you're 100% right. That's what happens when you cater to casuals that aren't loyal to the game. Snowflakes leave as quick as they showed up. That's a great analogy. I love that. Snowflakes hit the ground, they melt, they turn to water. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so um, it, it's terrible. So anyway, NBA in talks on bold new format. So what what is the, I guess, possibly uh, suggested possible new format? Um, Sham Sharania, NBA insider, uh, he says um, – The league, executives, coaches, and players have been in discussions to revamp the league's All-Star Weekend over the last six months, discussing a new format with the competition committee. And so the changes are set to be sweeping. Shams explains, with a new four-team tournament-style format consisting of three All-Star teams and the winner of the Rising Stars game, each All-Star team would reportedly consist of eight players each. So (laughs) that tells you 
they're they're just trying to come up with something at this point it almost seems like they're trying to get anything throw it on the wall see what sticks and try to get something to get people interested in the nba all-star game again and the fact that they have to do this and go through all of this stuff nba players should be ashamed and those same people who are telling me that the modern nba product is so much better man you can just hold that because we see that it's not they're trying so hard to come up with this stuff um let's see um lou what's going on notice none of these old heads say this about any sport besides the nba that's a fact that is a fact because in other sports lou as you know guys are still trying to compete right and it's we get it um we understand that the money is huge in the nba and when you're making that much money it's really hard to to get guys to compete right um i think i've said this on the show here before marvelous marvin Hagler, the great uh fighter rest of god bless the dead he once said it's hard to get up and run six miles when you're sleeping in silk pajamas you know what i mean um lou also says Adam Silver and LeBron James and his agency have totally ruined the NBA, the entitlement, the narcissism, acting like a diva above competition. It's also filtered down. Lou, you're 100% right. I couldn't say it any better. I don't have anything to add to that. You're right. Um, Lou also says, oh, here we go. <laughs> now with Bronny, it's like a bad joke. LeBron fans are basically people that eat at a horrible restaurant and defend it because it's the only place they ever ate at. Lou coming with the great analogies tonight. You're kicking it, Lou. You're spitting fire, bro. Get the fire extinguisher, man. Don't burn your crib down. I appreciate that, though. That's good stuff you're saying because it's true. And I'll tell you real quick, I'm not going to let this devolve into a, a Bronny thing. It's so interesting. You literally have people saying, like, you got so much hate for that man, LeBron. Now you're transferring it to Bronny, which is, like, utterly absurd and wild to me. But, you know, that that's how that's how some of these people are. But anyway, that just, so, um, yeah, back to the quick hit. What they're trying to do is basically take the All-Star game and they're trying to do anything they can to save it because they know – uh, that was a huge money maker for the NBA that whole weekend. Also, they're trying to um, I think they're trying to capitalize on the uh, three point shootout, which obviously we know is now the glamour event with the changes in the way the game is played, et cetera. That's the new glamour event of all star weekend. Last year, you had Steph Curry in a shootout against Sabrina Ionescu of the WNBA champion New York Liberty, which was actually awesome because the year before in the WNBA three point shootout, Sabrina Ionescu she set the three-point shootout record for male or female with the most makes and she shot last year against steph head to head and that was pretty cool steph ended up winning but it, it was really good and uh i think Inesco was shooting from the men's line too the only difference was she was using the women's ball but so that, that was real cool and so now um they are looking to do let's see they're looking to do a, possibly a um nba and w nba versus wnba shootout so not just stephanie and Eskew, but maybe clay uh, thompson would be involved caitlin clark might be involved these are some of the things that you're hearing so we'll see what happens at the end of the day that that tells you that <laughs> steve you're a funny dude at the end of the day what does that tell you that tells you that the nba is in a bad place and they are desperate and they're trying to do every and anything they can do to find something to save this faltering product. That's all there is to it. All right. Um, that's enough for the quick hits. Those quick hits took a little longer than I thought, but you know, you know me, once I get going, I get going, but let's get to the first topic y'all. Uh, last night. Um, well, let me go back a little bit. A few days ago, what Thursday night, today, Saturday, Thursday night, two days ago, I did a live and I talked about, uh, Jake Paul and Mike Tyson and the big fight on Netflix. And, uh, I discussed, um, how Jake Paul had a path to victory in that fight. I also, in fairness, I did say I, I thought Mike Tyson was going to win. And maybe some of that was the nostalgia talking. I'm 46 years old. So, you know, I was in grade school when Mike Tyson was, his, was at his absolute peak of his powers, demolishing everything in front of him. And just, I, I remember how great the dude was, right? But um, clearly that's not the same Mike Tyson. And I didn't expect to see that Mike Tyson, but I, I am uh, surprised. I'm not going to say pleasantly, but I'm surprised that Jake Paul was actually able to execute the plan that I mentioned. Maybe not to the level that I thought he needed to, but he did it. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so Mike uh, Mike Tyson and Jake Paul was the main event on, I think, Netflix's first foray into live sports, and that was last night. So they a lot of stuff went on there, and it, it wasn't all good, right? So um, you had a couple undercard fights and then a co-main event. So let's real quick, before we even get to uh, Tyson and Jake Paul, the co-main event of uh, Katie Taylor versus Amanda Serrano that I actually didn't see the first fight. That was a rematch. 
the first fight a lot of people saw as arguably uh, the greatest women's boxing match of all time and one of the greatest uh, slugfest slash firefight slash whatever you want to call it in boxing history, period, right? I saw some highlights from it. I was like, whoa, they was going. And so I said, all right, I'm going to make sure that I watch this fight tonight, um, tonight being last night. And I was thoroughly impressed, impressed man. Those ladies got after it. Uh, they didn't, they weren't with the, I'm not saying they didn't employ technique, but they also weren't with the, you know, uh, running and being on a bicycle. They really got in there and they competed because what do I always say, man? Boxing is a warrior sport and you have to have a warrior mentality. And those women, they had it last night. Right. And uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the controversy that was kind of involved in that fight. But uh, Katie Taylor and Amanda Serrano really got after it. And I'll say if you're a men's boxing fan, the best um, analogy I can give in terms of a similar men's fight would be uh, Arturo Gatti, Mickey Ward. Right. Especially that first fight. If anybody remembers round nine, Arturo Gatti, Mickey Ward, one of the greatest firefights in probably the history of boxing. That round one, around nine of that, probably right there with round one of Hagler Hearns, right? Those type of fights where just standing in there, really letting it loose, really going at it, and just, you know, seeing seeing who is going to get it done. Um, Steve, I got to I gotta disagree with you. <laughs> you know, it's uh, Steve says women fighting is gross, and um, I got to disagree. It's not you know, women just fighting on the street, acting crazy. This, you know, these are two women boxers. So um, I, I, I said, let me watch this fight. And um, because I was a big fan of Layla Ali when she was fighting, she was more of a technician. Um, I was, uh, but she was more of a technician. She had some power, but more of a technician. But then watching this fight, watching those two ladies go at it, as I said, it was really reminiscent to me of, you know, that Hagler Hearns round one and that Gaddy Ward round nine. I thought it was awesome. They really got into it. Now, Here's where the controversy comes in. First of all, I think Amanda Serrano got robbed. Uh, I believe she uh, connected on twice the power punches. She threw more, like 200 more punches, and she did her thing. But somehow uh, uh, Katie Taylor ended up getting the decision, which I thought was like, uh, I didn't like that at all. But here's the other thing. Uh, Amanda Serrano is a southpaw, which means she is a left-handed fighter, which means she leads with her uh, right hand and right foot. And Katie Taylor uh, is a conventional fighter, which means she leads left hand, left foot. So when she's coming in and she's uh, significantly shorter than Amanda Serrano. So when she's coming in, what happens? You have the headbutt. Um, she headbutted her a number of times, one of which she actually was Dr. Point. And that's another thing, right? She was Dr. Point, still somehow managed to win on the cards. But anyway, um, so you're watching and you're saying... Um, uh, you're watching this fight and you're like, damn, Amanda Serrano's doing her thing. But she had a brutal cut over her eyebrow from the headbutt by uh, Katie Taylor. And that turned into a big thing. Like I said, to the point that the referee dot Katie Taylor a point after the fight was announced, Amanda Serrano, as well as her uh, her trainer, both had a lot of strong commentary in the ring after the fight, uh, saying that uh, Katie Taylor did this purposefully. Amanda Serrano is also a UFC fighter. She was saying that in all the fights she's been in, she's never had cut issues until she fought Katie Taylor the first time. And again, this time she pointed to other fights Katie Taylor has had where people have gotten cuts from headbutts from her. So uh, I haven't watched the other Katie Taylor fights. I'm not going to speak to it like I'm an aficionado, but uh, I did think it was interesting. And I'm going to sit here and I'm going to tell you, just watching that fight, knowing a little something about boxing, I'm not going to brag. I know a little something about boxing. I believe Amando Serrano was robbed in that fight, plain and simple. So that was the controversy there. But it was an outstanding action fight if you watched it and you wanted to see an action fight. Um, Steve Splendor says Taylor's footwork was awful and she kept falling forward, leading with her head. No, I, I, I disagree that the footwork was awful. I just I think it was a matter of. You see this all the time in fights when you have a southpaw fighter versus a conventional fighter. Just because they're on opposites when they get close, when they get in the clinch, and especially if one is shorter than the other, a lot of times you see the headbutts happen and somebody gets split. It's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. I don't know that I believe that Katie Taylor was doing this purposefully. And in her defense, Amanda Serrano, uh, she put out a post, I think, on X today, either X or Instagram, maybe both. And she apologized for insinuating or stating, not even insinuating, for saying that she believed that Katie Taylor uh, was doing that on purpose. She kind of chalked it up to, you know, um, the, 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 the heat of battle immediately after the fight. And sometimes that is true, whatever the sport is, whether it's boxing or basketball or football or what have you. You interview somebody immediately after that sport is over. They haven't had time to calm down. They haven't had time to kind of cool off and, and get their thoughts together. They'll kind of say whatever. 
And so um, she she did apologize for that today. And she said she, if they can work it out, she's down for the rematch. So that's a fight I would watch again. I'm not even going to lie to you. That is a fight that I would watch for a um, uh, a third time. So, uh, yeah, so a great fight. So that was the co-main event, right? Katie Taylor, Amanda Serrano. Outstanding fight. Then you have the main event. Everybody's been waiting for Jake Paul versus Mike Tyson. And, all right, can I admit something to y'all? Can I admit something to y'all? I got fooled, man. I got fooled. I felt like watching, uh, you know, the training videos Mike Tyson was putting out, et cetera, the work he was putting in. I felt like if he could get to Jake Paul within the first couple of rounds, he would have a legitimate chance to beat him because of his power. But then you just watch Mike is not the same. His reflexes aren't the same at 58 years old. What did I expect? Right. He's not able to slip punches and move the same way. He can't get inside the same way. Jake Paul did exactly what I said was the path to victory. What was that? He was on his bicycle. He was moving. He was sticking as he was moving. Um, he had a significant reach advantage on Tyson, which was never an issue when Iron Mike was younger. But it is now, now that he doesn't have the legs um, or or the explosiveness, explosiveness, excuse me, to get inside. Um, let's see. <laughs> Steve says, why you got fooled, bro? Anyone can throw five punches in a three second clip. No, it. I, I feel you, Sneed. It just looked like one at 58 with the way he was training, like he was out there running sp- uh, he was out there lifting. He was out there actually running sprints, which even when you see one of these older guys getting one of these fights or whatever, right? Charity fight or an event like that, you don't see him running sprints and doing all that stuff, right? So I I was under the impression also that like when you see him doing the mitt work, you know, I felt that he still had the head movement. Uh, his combinations look good. They looked sharp. Now, I, I absolutely didn't believe he would have the stamina to be able to hang in there. And that's why I said on my preview that if Jake Paul got on his bike after round three, he would be able to kind of take over the fight. And that's exactly what he did. And that's exactly how it played out. Um, so, yeah, that that's that's why I got fooled. Um, let's see. Lou says, when I heard Tyson say legacy doesn't matter, I knew he was just in for that cash grab and I didn't watch it. So, you know what? I didn't I disagree with that, Lou. I don't think it was a function of um, when he said legacy doesn't matter. He didn't care. I don't believe that. I think that's just the way he kind of sees life like. A lot of times when you listen to interviews that he does and stuff like that, he just has a, I want to say an almost like fatalistic worldview. You know, he, that's just kind of how he sees things. So I didn't, I didn't take it as he was just in for the cash grab. So uh, Netflix, as we'll, we'll go ahead and we'll talk about this part a little bit. Uh, Netflix had their own issues, right? And what were Netflix's issues? Netflix's issues were that um, they said, that 60 million people tuned in to watch the Tyson Jake Paul fight, right? Um, which I think is the the biggest audience for a combat sport event ever, right? Um, Netflix also said that 50 million tuned in for the Katie Taylor, Amanda Serrano. So why am I bringing this up? I'm bringing this up because Netflix servers, uh, their network infrastructure was not prepared for this. And uh, if you watch, um, or, or read the tweets and uh, read articles about it today and all that stuff, uh, Netflix broke. <laughs> you know, we, for those of us who watched it, I don't, I don't know about anybody here, but I know a number of people were reporting and and I, I, I experienced it myself that uh, there was constant buffering, there was constant freezing, uh, the sound was going out, just the overall, uh, the technical uh, work of the presentation was just uh, piss poor, if we're honest. And Netflix, that that was really bad for their for, first foray into live sports programming. And they need to get this fixed and get this fixed quickly because come Christmas Day, they've got two football games that they need to broadcast. And the NFL, obviously, you know, is counting on them to to put out a good product. So you got that. Um, Bruce says, I must admit, Jake Paul is a huge draw. 65 million people watched it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I knew that he was an influencer and, you know, he had a lot of people wanting to uh, see what he was going to do. But uh, even with that said, I didn't expect that that many people were going to watch it. But, hey, you know, shouts to them, shouts to him. He did his thing. And, you know, if you watched, I mean, it was just, uh, like I said, it was tough to watch. And you can see, look, he's just he's just sticking and moving calmly. So, Mike, you saw that was one that he landed early, but he wasn't able to consistently get in there. And now the old Mike Tyson can slip this. Not 58 year old. Well, he is the old Mike Tyson now, but you know what I mean? The younger Mike Tyson, the he could have slipped that. And even Roy Jones Jr. said, you know, four or five years ago, he was surprised at how well Mike Tyson was slipping punches. But that's not the same one. Also, 
Mike Tyson clearly didn't have the legs under him. And then even at the ends of the rounds, you could see how exhausted he was just walking back to his corner and how long it took him to get up off the stool at the end of the round breaks, you know? So, uh, it was, uh, it was, it was something to watch. So you see, uh, Jake Paul was landing clearly. So, um, I was talking to some people today and they were saying, you know, they feel like, uh, Jake Paul, um, they feel like Jake Paul kind of carried him and they, he didn't close Mike Tyson out when he could have. And I say, I call BS on that one. And the reason I call BS on that one is because Jake Paul knew that to try and knock Mike Tyson out, he would have to stand in there and really throw with him. And he was concerned about the fire that was going to come back. And that's real because what do they say? Uh, the last thing to go on a fighter is, is the punching power, right? So he definitely, he was concerned about it. That's why he was not going to go in there and risk anything. He was going to pot shot him from the outside. If he could land a long, uh, a right hand, then he was going to do that. But he wasn't going to actually go in there and try to, you know, exchange with him because Mike can still catch you to the body. He can still, uh, he can still uh, catch you with an uppercut. He, he can do those things. The power is still there. But um, I, Mike really needs to hang it up. They really need, he really needs to hang it up. I mean, we all love Mike, but it's clear that the nostalgia we had was, um, was it? I guess, I guess it was false and that there was no way that we were ever going to see anything even close to the Mike Tyson that uh, we we once knew and loved uh, again. And so he needs to just go ahead and definitively say, I'm never going to fight again because he it's, it's unfortunate he's making a mockery of his uh, once greatness. And, and that, you know, that's uh, that's that's the thing. Uh, Steve said, Jake Paul is an L. Women fighting is an L. Me falling down my basement steps earlier was an L. This cold weather is an L. Um, yeah, Jake Paul is an L. The women fighting, I disagree with you because, like I said, that Amanda Serrano and uh, uh, Katie Taylor was the best fight of the night, hands down. They were going at it. Me falling down my basement steps earlier was an L. Yeah, man. Uh, hope, hope you're okay. This cold weather is an L. Well, I'm in Florida. It doesn't get too cold here, but I will say I miss the snow. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, so yeah, Jake Paul, man, now we got the, what I don't like about this whole thing. Now we got this guy talking about, he wants Canelo next. I'm like, come on. Like, I respect the fact that you think you're taking this seriously, but Canelo, Canelo, he may not be in his prime, but I think Canelo would beat the living. He would beat the dog crap out of Jake Paul. Like, don't do that. You don't have to be a Canelo fan. And I'm not, you don't have to be a Canelo fan to acknowledge that. Like, that's just silly. First of all, all this going up and down and wait, what was Jake Paul last night? 228, 227. So even if he fights um, at cruiserweight, that's going to be really tough. What's, what's cruiserweight? About 190. So he's going to have to drop 30 pounds to fight um, Canelo. All right. So Bruce, uh, let me answer this. Jake Paul said he showed him grace. Bruce, he didn't show him grace. What I said was, um, I don't know if you heard it. I don't believe he showed him grace at all. I believe he was smart because he knew if he wanted to finish him off, he'd have to go in there and stand close enough where fire might come back. And he didn't want any parts of that. I do not believe that. Um, let's see. Uh, Teddy Atlas despised Mike, said Mike only had five real fights in his life and he lost all five. Wow. Yeah, I know he does despise Mike. There was the whole thing of, uh, I think he said that Mike at one point like touched his niece um, improperly, uh, inappropriately when they were probably about like 15, 16 and he pulled the gun on him and he was like, yo, you know, you do that again, I'll effing kill you. So uh, there's that. But um, so, yeah, that, that that's what we got, man. Netflix, Netflix blew it because their network infrastructure was in terrible shape. They weren't prepared to deal with that. I, I don't know why they wouldn't be, though. If you expect a massive draw and a massive viewership for this fight, why would you not have your network infrastructure properly prepared? But I guess they're looking at it and say, hey, better that than we we anger the NFL with, um, you know, having these problems on a Christmas Day game. So, you know, uh, your favorite hater. What's good, your favorite hater? Um, does this hurt Tyson's legacy? No, but he just needs to hang it up. It doesn't because he still gets away with he's 58 years old. Right. It's almost like. Um, and we'll kind of get to this later. It's almost like at one point I heard Chris Broussard say there's nothing pretty much that can hurt LeBron's legacy right now because whatever he does is icing on the cake, right? He's already had a Hall of Fame career. Some people think he's a GOAT. Some people think he's the second best player of all time. I don't think he's either of those, but not the point. So, But he says if LeBron doesn't win anymore and even if he starts playing poorly, it's year 22. So what? If he does win, 
then that's amazing. Me personally, I don't I don't really go by that. You you can't have it both ways like that. But um, so the point I'm trying to make is no, it doesn't hurt Tyson's legacy because he's 58 years old and he was going against a guy who is 31 years younger than him. But he really needs to hang it up. There's no reason to do anything more like this. It was cool. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree with you, Sneed. That was a terrible mentality. But we we also know that Bruce Art is kind of on the payroll. So there's that too. But anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're right, Steve. Yeah. So so your favorite hater, um, no, I don't believe it hurts Tyson's legacy, but it is a definitive statement to Tyson that he needs to hang it up and not try to do this anymore. He just doesn't have it anymore. And it's not because he doesn't want to have it anymore. It's just because he physically cannot have it anymore. He just physically can't. Um, Lou says LeBron might not hurt his overall legacy as a Hall of Famer and all-time great player, but he is moving not closer to GOAT status. But all the antics and cheating the game are moving him further. I absolutely agree with you on that because it's funny. Um, even all the people who constantly caped up for him with, with all his nonsense, they are being forced to criticize him even those who never want to do it brian windhorse who literally made his career off of lebron he he was forced to criticize lebron the other day and you could see how much it hurt him to have to do it in terms of this whole brownie thing right so you know there's all of that um so you know uh it, it's gonna get worse and worse nino what's good my brother good to see you here man always good to see my main man nino uh lou says um uh nino says lou how do you cheat the game you know, we're not going to do that right now, man. We're not going to do that because as you can see, I am going to attempt to give LeBron flowers in that third topic. All right. So bear with me. All right. <laughs> it might not be as much as you want, but just bear with me. So anyway, um, Mike Tyson last night was a dud. Netflix was a dud. Overall, the best thing about last night in that card was Katie Taylor, Amanda Serrano putting on an absolute barn burner. I really enjoyed that fight, but yeah, that is what I've got. That's what I got on that first topic. Um, all right, so I'm going to put the number in the chat. That's 904-219-8264. 904-219-8264. And I'm going to open up the phone lines if anybody wants to call in and give me your thoughts on uh, boxing, on Mike Tyson, on Jake Paul in boxing, Amanda Serrano and uh, 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 Katie Taylor. Um, Netflix uh, dropping the ball on their technical specifications last night. Give me your thoughts, man. I, I want to hear from you. Let's get it. In the meantime, let's go through some more of these chats. And then uh, if we don't get any calls, we'll just move on. Um, Steve says, the PEDs, the Diddy, the Daddy Daycare ain't going to help his legacy. Wow. Yeah, but at this point, Steve, nothing is going to hurt LeBron's legacy unless, like you said, unless he gets caught out there with, um, like literally unless he gets caught out there and it gets exposed with the Diddy party stuff as having doing something really terrible at said parties or unless he legitimately gets caught like busted um, with, a, with a dirty test for the PEDs. Those are the only two things that are going to hurt LeBron. Like not that I'm advocating it, of course, I absolutely would never. But I legitimately believe that if LeBron was to smack his wife, somehow he would get away with that. Like there's almost nothing this guy could do there's almost nothing this guy could do um, to, to ruin his legacy. That is how powerful uh, the media, uh, the, the, the media protection is around this guy. It's that powerful. All right, two more minutes. Uh, let's see if uh, anybody wants to call in and give us your thoughts on last night on Tyson and uh, Tyson Netflix, the boxing card, all of that. Um, in the meantime, for those of you who are college football fans, Georgia and Tennessee are about to play. And again, if you all know me, I am not an SEC guy at all. However, they are very important to the fabric of college football because they play a major role in how things shake out. Their conference wields an inordinate amount of power. And so tonight I'm rooting for Tennessee to win this game at Georgia Sanford Stadium. And the reason why is because at that point, if Georgia has three losses, it's going to be almost impossible for the committee to justify putting them into the college football playoff. And even though they could have three losses, if they got in, they would still be one of the best teams in the country. And Kirby Smart is easily one of the best coaches in the country. And he would have those guys ready to go and they would still be dangerous enough to make a run and win the national championship. And I don't want to see that. <laughs> so, um, 
I'm rooting for Tennessee tonight. So let's see what happens.